This video will go over the main strategies you might see used in the clinic or on the wards for atrial fibrillation. We'll talk especially about the CHAD score, which I'm very sure you'll come across at some point on your medicine rotation. So to review, the main reason atrial fibrillation is of concern to patients and providers is that it is an independent risk factor for ischemic stroke. Compared to strokes not caused by atrial fibrillation, strokes caused by AFib have increased morbidity and mortality and being present in greater than 1% of the general population means you'll likely encounter it on the wards. You can divide the management of atrial fibrillation into three arms, rate control, rhythm control, and prevention of systemic embolization or anticoagulation. Now based on the AFFIRM trial, rate control with chronic anticoagulation is recommended over rhythm control as a first line therapy. This means beta blockers, i.e. atenolol or metoprolol, as well as calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem and verapamil are to be used first before rhythm control. Rhythm control meaning something like pharmacological cardioversion or DC cardioversion. Anticoagulation is the other mainstay of management and will be the focus of this presentation. Basically, the big thing about anticoagulation is trying to figure out which patient we should give it to. Now the way we do this currently is by using the CHAD score. Now if there's anything you try to remember from this presentation, it's the score. Now CHADS2 is an easy acronym to memorize as it stands for congestive heart failure, hypertension, age greater than 75 years old, diabetes, and stroke. Now one point is assigned for each risk factor except stroke which is assigned two points. So those with a CHAD score of zero are considered low risk and should be managed with aspirin. Those with a score of two or higher are considered high risk, which means they should receive anticoagulation therapy, assuming they don't have the contraindications that I've listed below. Now the debate continues to be one in which we're trying to figure out what should we do with the people who have a score of one and are considered of intermediate risk. Unfortunately, the answer to that question is a very unsatisfying one, as there really is no right answer. And typically, whether to give a patient anticoagulation therapy versus just giving aspirin is a result of a discussion between the patient and the providers of the risk and benefits. Now, if you do a little bit more research, you might come across the HasBlood Outpatient Bleeding Risk Assessment Tool. It's basically a validated tool used to predict the risk of bleeding in patients taking warfarin. I'll leave it at that, but it might be something interesting to look into or present on rounds. Now, since the CHADS2 score has come out, a second scoring has emerged, which you should know about, called the chads Basque score. Essentially, this adds extra parameters to the CHADS2 score and bumps people out of the intermediate risk category into the high risk category. Now, while I was on the wards, the CHADS2 BAS score was fairly new, so I never had to memorize the extra parameters, but I think you should at least have an idea of some of the parameters that are added. However, at this point, there's no research to favor one score over the other. Now, let's briefly talk about the current anticoagulation options. Certainly, the one that's been around the longest is warfarin. Of course, it's a great drug because it reduces the risk of stroke by two-thirds compared to patients who are not receiving antithrombotic therapy. But of course, the degree of benefit from warfarin depends on the stroke risk. So the reason why there's a lot of money going into the drug development for alternatives is that there are some shortcomings with warfarin. For example, it's very difficult to maintain patients in the therapeutic INR range, and patients need to have weekly blood draws. More importantly, there's a bleeding risk of 2% per year. Now, bleeding is typically defined as hemorrhage requiring hospitalization with transfusion of greater than two packed red blood cell units. You should also note that there are a few patients that we should definitely anticoagulate. Those are the patients with prior ischemic stroke, TIA, or a systemic embolic event. The goals of INR for warfarin therapy are 2 to 3 for most patients and 2.5 to 3.5 for those at higher risk, the higher risk patients I've listed here for your information. While warfarin is the mainstay of treatment, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other players in the anticoagulation game. These new drugs, rather than inhibiting the vitamin K dependent clotting factors as in the case with warfarin, inhibit other factors in the clotting cascade. Most of these drugs listed here are still in clinical trial testing, but basically drugs with this type of mechanism are going to be the next new thing. The drug that's been out the longest is dabigatran or Pradaxa, and this one is a 2A inhibitor. I'll use this example as a prototype for the other types of drugs since it's been out the longest. Basically, just to note, it came out on the market based on the results from the RELY trial. To sum up the results of the study, 
dabigatran showed a lower risk of stroke as well as major bleeding. The only main complications being a slightly higher MI rate and higher rate of GI bleeding when compared to warfarin. The conclusions of the study showed that patients should continue warfarin if they've already been on warfarin and are comfortable with taking it and doing the weekly blood draws. Also, if patients could not comply with a new twice daily dosing of dabigatran or could deal with the expensive cost. One of the biggest challenges with these factor inhibitor drugs is not being able to test patient adherence because there's no quick blood draw for an INR as in the case with warfarin. And in addition, there are no antidotes for overdoses of these drugs as is the case for warfarin. I've listed some of the other trials here you might want to look into for awards presentation if you're interested in learning about some of the other anticoagulation drugs aside from Pradaxa that are out on the market. Now here are the take home points. First, the mainstays of AFib treatment are rate, rhythm, and long-term anticoagulation. CHADS-2 stands for CHF, hypertension, age greater than 75, diabetes, and stroke, which is assigned two points instead of just one. CHADS-2-VASC assigns an extra point to vascular disease, age greater than 65 instead of 75, and female gender. Most importantly, the CHAD score is used to determine what type of anticoagulation a particular patient should receive. Those with a score of zero should get aspirin. Those with a score of greater than or equal to two should receive anticoagulation. And those with a score of one is kind of the gray area where they can either have aspirin or anticoagulation. Thanks and hope this helps.